it is my has been my dream to do, to discuss what I'm going to be able to discuss today. So my assignment is to discuss um, an advocate's vision for a complete spectrum of care, and that is the culmination of many years of, of being involved in the eating disorder world. And just briefly, uh, my family fell down this rabbit hole in 2002 and my daughter became ill. Um, I published a book about it in 2004 uh, and that was very exciting and I thought that would be the end of that. Um, then I, I was contacted by so many people that I thought, okay, well we need to gather people together and you know, we need to put on a play in the barn. And so we created the Around the Dinner Table Forum, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about. Uh, later, I helped to start Maudsley Parents. That was in 2006. And then we founded Feast in 2008. And last year, I uh, very happily retired from full-time advocacy and became, uh, you know, went, went somewhat back to my normal life. So I've actually gone in a circle. And really, Today is all going to be about circles on the theme of our uh, our conference uh, that Leah said con connecting the dots. So I'm taking that to heart. Now I'm a woman of a certain age, and I just reached the point where I get to buy a car that I really want, and I bought a Mini Cooper. And when I first got into this crazy little car, the the guy said it's all about circles. <laughs> and as you can see, <laughs> it's just like it's all just one big amount of circles. And I think that when we're dealing with eating disorders, we're also dealing about circles. And I think a lot about parents hugging their children. And the circle that we're putting around our children when we're treating, when they're in treatment, is we're providing a safe circle around our children. And I think that's something that when our kids get an eating disorder, kind of goes out. We somehow got this weird circle that doesn't make sense. It's a paradox. And we're really struggling to keep that full circle around our kids anymore because they're just somehow drifting away from the loving, protective circle that we've been putting around them. I'm gonna make a radical statement here, is that I don't think that we have so much controversy in this field as, as we used to. I think that it's not really about what kind of treatment we're getting. I think we've done a lot of arguing about, well, it should be this and we should be doing that, but there actually is some consensus among Really, the, around the people that are really doing specialist eating disorder care, there's more consensus than you'd think. I think we do know what to do with eating disorder treatment, but we're just not doing it, and there are reasons. And after 10 years of being around this world, half of it, half my time spent with the professional world, and half my time spent with the parent world, this is what I, this is the culmination of 10 years of watching what's going on, and my somewhat radical proposal on how we need to address it, and it has to do with circles. I think we know that the basics of eating disorder treatment, regardless of what modality or what place we are, or whether we're inpatient, outpatient, hospitalization, let's just let all that go for a moment. We actually know these are the things we need to be doing. We have to identify early if we can. That's just one of the most important things. We definitely need to intervene. We can't just let people go without treatment. We can't delay. It needs to be multidisciplinary, which means we can't just go to one provider and do one kind of treatment from one, uh, you know, from the nutritionist side or from the psychology side or go to a psychiatrist. We have to bring all those elements in. We know we have to restore normal, optimal nutrition and metabolism for the patient or they're not going to get well. It's just, that's it. There can't be any compensatory behaviors that are undermining that work. So we're talking about the full spectrum of eating disorders. We know we have to restore normal eating behavior, not just content, but normal behaviors around food. We know we have to, while we're doing that, provide a safe and very nurturing environment under very difficult times, because during recovery, providing a calm, stable home is a little more difficult than when they're feeling normally. And we have to teach skills to, a lot, to most patients in order to help them stay in that state of normality. We have to deal with comorbid conditions if they exist. And we need to have a relapse percent prevention plan in place. Now we all know that these are the elements of treatment, but we're still not doing it. 
Now, why is that? I think we can all sit down and, and think of reasons in our own lives why that didn't happen at certain times. These are the barriers that I'm seeing, and I think we can relate to most of them. We have very slow recognition of eating disorders. I, I think how many of the parents here got an eating disorder diagnosis within a month of when they knew something was going on? Six or seven. That, that's actually that's not bad. Most of us do not. We have a real lack of agreement between providers. So you might get a really good assessment from one person and get a good treatment plan from one person and they say, now I want you to work with a nutritionist down the street. You go to them, the same person that was recommended by the first, and they'll give you an entirely different target, an entirely different way that they speak to your child in your presence. There's a, there's a disconnect there. So we're, we're, it's a barrier to getting that, those basics that we've all decided we need to do. Definite lack of public support. Um, I know for myself and for most of the parents I talk to, even if you know what you need to be doing to support your child through recovery, your neighbors and the people down at the church, the teachers, the coach, there are a lot of people that are gonna try to undermine that because they don't get it, they don't understand it. There's a lack of community support for what we need to do as families to get this done. Enormous financial gaps, and this is a very American problem. Yeah, Feast is international, so we deal with people from all countries. And the financial issue, well, for example, for Canada, is different than for the United States because of the way we fund health care or not fund health care because of private insurance, lack of insurance. Um, different states have different rules. So we have these gaps financially that undermine our ability to create the system that we need to keep our kids well. We have a general misunderstanding about mental illness, as we all know. I don't think that we live in a society that understands uh, mental illness of any type, and eating disorders in particular seems to suffer from a real genuine not understanding of what we're dealing with, and stigma, horrible stigma, which gets in the way of us doing what we need to do. Exhaustion is, as caregivers, we all know, but it also applies to clinicians. Clinicians can be exhausted by the process of trying to get a family this exhaustion dealing with their own colleagues in trying to create a spectrum of care and burnout among clinicians and frustration is is a serious problem that it's our problem too as families we need to deal with the fact that we're dealing with providers who have chosen a very difficult illness that isn't supported by society isn't supported by laws that help them do their job to help us and then there's an osteoporosis which you're going to hear again, and you may have been able to pronounce by the, by the end of this. It's very important. I'll talk about it later. But where are the holes in this circle? So we know there's a lack of communication, and that's at the heart of a lot of the problems that we have, is that the people aren't communicating between each other. We have a lack of consensus, and that's, you know, in the professional world, there's a lack of consensus. Follow through. You know, you might get one part, and then a month later, you know, you can't follow through with what you knew you needed to do. Uh, there's a lack of accountability in treatment because you'll have, you know, have one parent or one provider who's pulling against the rest of, of the goals of, of the treatment. There's a problem that the weakest link in a, in a system of trying to protect a patient has a lot of power. If you have one person a spouse or a provider or a sibling or someone who is ready to take the role of undermining the whole thing, they have enormous power because we really need to have that full, complete circle. So the one who's willing to pull that apart and keep it open has more power than they should, obviously. There are many undermining influences while we're trying to get this done. And you know, some of them are just the normal course of life, but there's we're not dealing in a vacuum when we're trying to take care of one patient. We're dealing in a system of a life and a treatment system that there's gonna be things that undermine it. I think I hear most from parents about the allure of normal. We just want to be normal. And that, I think, may be one of our biggest enemies as families is that 
just desperation to be able to get back to the life that we thought we were leading before this happened. And then for a while, we try to like, we're, we're dragged down because we don't want to accept that this is going to be very serious, it's going to be very difficult. And that lure, that siren song of normal can really be a problem for all of us. And I think that goes for clinicians as, as well as parents. And then again, there's that anosognosia thing. So what is anosognosia? I personally believe that this is one of the most important factors in mental illness in general that we're not acknowledging. I think it's the, probably the biggest misunderstanding that we have between ourselves and, our, and the child. And I think if we could all, if the whole field um, and parents and advocates could get together on agreeing how to pronounce this, <laughs> <laughs> and to use it, um, that would be really great. I'm going to tell you, I've had a great deal of trouble getting that word published in eating disorder literature and managed it twice. I do a lot of writing and, you know, well, of course, I can publish it myself, but the word means a lack of insight, a brain-based lack of insight into what's going on with your body and with your thinking. And if you're dealing with someone who cannot see themselves clearly, cannot feel ill, cannot understand why the people around them are waving their arms crazily and losing their minds. But why is mom so angry? Why, why are you talking about this? Why, why are you so obsessed, mom? Anosognosia helps me as a parent to understand what's going on. It helps I'm not me. Sure what you said there. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it, help, it helps a lot for me to melt anger. It, when I understood that my daughter couldn't understand what was going on with her, and then she would later, I needed that. Because it helped keep me compassionate. It helped get my anger, um, you know, at a minimum. It helped me keep hope that she would again regain her ability. But and also not to blame her that she couldn't see it. Because she, for, for a little while, she was gone. She was unable to engage with the world and her illness the way we were, and that it was our job as parents to do that for her, to be the insight and the motivation for a little while on her behalf. And I wasn't always given permission to do that as a parent. And so that's why I share this with parents so often, is because I want parents to know that they need to sometimes carry that for their children for a while until they're able. And my daughter now does not suffer from anosognosia. Uh, she knows that she was ill. She knows that she was not aware at the time. And she has great insight and motivation now. And that's um, something I'd like everyone to know can happen. So where is the circle breaking? It's breaking across settings. And I think we've heard that a lot here. You leave uh, the hospital and your outpatient team has a completely different view, even a different weight target, different view of your role as a parent. You know, are you supposed to have a meal plan or not a meal plan? So as you change settings, as you go down in treatment, or even worse, if you have to go up in treatment, because the message to our kids when we change settings, that we're no longer in charge, that we're no longer considered part of the team, that can be very undermining when they come home. So we have this situation of you know, where across, you go across settings and you're not having a consistent view of the illness and your role as a parent and you're undermined in your caregiving role. We all know, and my husband and I suffered from this a great deal, is a, we had a, a lot of break between him and I because we reacted differently to the illness at different stages. And so there would be times when I'd be angry and he'd be very calm collaborative, not collaborative, oh, I think she's fine, or she's not fine. So between us, there was breaks. Between disciplines, I cannot tell you how frustrating it is to me how differently I see dietitians, psychiatrists, psychologists, social workers, nursing staff. Really, a very big difference in how they view the illness, treatment, parent role, and how to treat the patient as, as a, person, a fellow human being. 
our kids are getting a different view of their illness from each discipline that they visit. That's a problem. That's keeping us from doing this circle that we really, really need to do. Over time, obviously, we have an enormous problem that early in the diagnosis, people think one thing, they become 18, we've got another problem. Uh, if, they're, if we're gonna see the basic illness is different, and not just the person has gotten older, we have a problem. And this is causing a great deal of problems with families trying to get the, keep the care, keep the circle. Head to toe, we have um, a peculiar problem with this illness where we think that medical state and psychological state are somehow disconnected and that we can uh, treat one and not the other or treat one and then the other or that we can treat uh, psych someone psychologically and that that will cause them to then do better with the medical part. I do not see a difference. I do not see a separation there. The mind and body to me, that just seems like a, you know, a bad philosophy. But it's one of the reasons that we're having trouble as a field and as a, fam a family community in getting that circle there. Across diagnoses, how many of you have had your uh, loved one change diagnoses over time. I, I certainly did, and I talked to lots of families where they go in and out of an anorexia diagnosis. They're di di well, you're not anorexic anymore. Or you're anorexic and now you're adenose. And this, this discontinuity is causing us problems that I don't think we're acknowledging. And of course, and this is really, really basic, is there's a disconnect between the person and their disorder. Again, anosognosia, but also, we're talking about young people who are developing and they don't really understand what happened to them. And so we're dealing with a person who's disconnected from their own illness and that's a break in the circle of keeping that person well. My daughter recovered when she was, she got ill when she was 14, she recovered when she was 15. She did not remember the experience despite my writing a book. <laughs> she went to college and her roommate went on a diet because she ate too many blonde brownies remember this detail. And she didn't remember that dieting was going to be a problem. She just like, well, it's what we're doing. My roommate and I are going on a diet. And of course, this was catastrophic to me. And you know, she knew enough to hide it from me because she thought, oh, your mom's crazy about that. But she didn't really understand what went on. So she had to disconnect herself with her own disorder. So here's my feeling. Is the ideal situation is surrounding the patient. So we get, we, the first circle is the law, is our legal system, is our government, it's, our, let's just limit it to your country for this, for the purposes of this. Then there's the community, the people around you, your school, your church community, your, um, your band community, the, the people around you that you're gonna encounter in your life, your community. Then there's, of course, the professional treatment now you see, these are all encircling one another, and they're, they're, it's a full circle. <coughs> then you have the family, and then of course the patient. Here's what I think will resonate for most of you, is what we end up doing is we've got this patient who's supposed to be in the center of all these concentric circles and kept safe by them. But they are allowed to just drift off and be on their own. And the rest of us are all waving our arms and trying to get things done. The patient's not in the circle. The patient is not inside the circle of all of these protections because we have these crazy ideas, anosognosia, and our laws, and our customs about autonomy that allow us to just let the patient go off and, and then we go, like, we'll come back. You know, we're all here. We got, we got these circles going on. They're, they're not having it because they're ill. So we need to keep the patient in there. But, okay, I'm, the animations are out of control here, but it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what I see as an advocate. As I see us all bouncing off and we're somewhat protecting each other, we're somewhat intercepting, but the law ends up protecting the patient most often our conventions and our laws and, and the way we work things so that the patient is incompletely covered by the law. If the law was gonna actually do the whole job of making sure our kids stayed in treatment, make sure there's good treatment, 
you know, hey, you know what, I'm good with that, but they don't. And basically what we end up with is the patient still rolling off on the run. It's a problem. So let's imagine this scenario. We've got a 14-year-old girl. She doesn't want to eat any more than two meals a day. She's convinced that she has to exercise despite an injury that's, or a doctor says she can't exercise. And she's had a big fight with her best friend. Her parents are freaked out. So they go to the pediatrician. And the pediatrician says the typical things. By the way, this is my daughter. So except for the part where she should drink, have more salt. Because she was fainting. <laughs> so there was the first situation where the professionals were not, you know, there's no circle. And we as family didn't know what to, what to do to make the circle. So we've got the same situation. And the mother and father, there they also are going to struggle to figure out what to do. And OK, we didn't fire an iPad. <laughs> but um, this is what happens in families, is we're, we're not quite sure what to do. And because there, had, there isn't a circle around us to tell us what to do. So the parents do boneheaded things. Again, guilty. After they get the iPad, that was when their boyfriend broke up. <laughs> <laughs> Blame my husband. <laughs> then you got the coach. Because in the community, there are people that have influence on your kids. And they do boneheaded things. So we got all this, these knucklehead moves where they do stuff that undermines what we need to do. Her sister, OK, my daughter doesn't have a sister, so I can make one up. But in this situation, this is the kind of thing that siblings do naturally, is they ally with their the sibling. They behave like another peer. They say the things that you know other peers will say. And it's not helpful. It's not where we want to go with creating that circle of treatment. We've already discussed what the laws are going to do. They're not going to be good. They're going to give autonomy even to a 14-year-old. They're not going to fund training in schools. There's not going to be emergency psychiatric help. In our state, in uh, Virginia, uh, emergency psychiatric care, I'm sure you heard one of our, our representatives recently what was slashed and then uh, the boy killed himself because they couldn't find a hospital bed for him. And the, because in Virginia, if you need emergency psychiatric care, you're not going to find it. It's just not there. There are no beds. Insurance company is not going to be helpful. They're not going to have specialist physicians to make decisions. They're going to do it on a 48-hour basis at best. They're not going to help us do what we need to do. School, big problem. They're teaching healthy eating interventions. They're doing caliber testing for children. Uh, they're going to not tell parents if there's a problem. They're going to say, you know, hey, let's, we'll, we'll keep this a secret. Schools are not helping us do what we need to do for eating disorder treatment. So this is just the first week. <laughs> now, imagine all the things and all the ways and all of these circles that could have been surrounding the family um, and surrounding the patient, how that could have happened, you know, in the first week. Is it going to get any better when there's an emergency psychiatric moment where, you know, you're trying to go to the ER? Um, when you go from clinician to clinician trying to get help? The circle is not holding. And what I hear from families all over the world every day is that part of the circle is really strong. You know, they say, I'm a good parent. I'm doing everything I can. Or I've got the, we've got the best therapist. Or there might be a, a team of professionals that are really great, but there's one adult in the family or one influence that is putting a hole in the circle so the efforts of everyone else are being undermined. So I think I'm gonna I'm gonna say that unless we start looking at this in the big picture and as the as the full circle then a lot of us are, are just, we're just running on a wheel, and we need to take a bigger look. And as an advocate of, of these 10 years of watching what we're going through and around the world, I think it is time for us to step back and stop talking about, well, everyone should do X and, you know, Monsley and, you know, what, whatever our, our thing or the thing that didn't work in our house. 
and we're not taking responsibility for the fact that all of us, if we were working together, could do a better job of creating a better circle in all of these concentric groups. But when a parent is in the thick of it, that is not a time to do it, obviously. And most of us are at least at a state where we could come to a conference. But there's a lot of people out there who want to do something. And I think that we all can be doing something. And the biggest problem is that everybody can legitimately say that they're just doing their job. But I think the problem is that we're going to have to take responsibility for not just doing our job. I know this is a big burden, but we're going to have to make sure that other people are doing their job as well. And we're going to just, as a parent community, pull back a bit and see what we should be doing to support these circles, to make sure that families don't have to go through a lot of crap that a lot of us have had to endure. And a lot of clinicians who are specializing in eating disorders, difficult disorder, who aren't getting the support even from the parent community to do that, because we're, we're in the trenches, we're doing our best. But I think we've reached a point where we can actually start to envision a better way of supporting the field. Not always voluntarily, by the way, but I think we're going to have to start making ourselves known that we want to be there to make this system work better. Because it's not just the clinicians that are having problems, not just the families, but I think everyone's pretty frustrated and we need to work together. So there's, there, I can give you a lot of reasons why the system is not working and I've discussed some of them, um, but we have some specific issues that are really causing us, all, us all problems. For example, target weight ranges. There is no protocol for this. There is no agreed upon way of doing this. And so when you try to change treatment providers, you try to step down or step up a level, or you try to go between your physician and your dietitian, you're gonna get a different story. That's ridiculous. We have the science to do this, but when I go to uh, I go to AD and I go to other organizations, professional organizations, nobody's interested in doing this, and I think they're going to need a little pressure. I have spent five years trying to get someone to publish a paper that says one thing: that weight restoration is related to psychological recovery. Believe it or not. There is no document that you can hand your doctor that just says weight restoration will probably help with psychological recovery. You would have to give them a sheaf of papers and they would have to infer it from it. That's ridiculous. We can do better. I'm going to need to. But there may have to be some better. <laughs> Legal adulthood is, a, is, is an artificial thing when it comes to mental illness. And we as a community, I think, need to recognize that this issue becomes this cliff that families go off when their kids turn 18 that is artificial and cruel to the patient. And it's cruel to the, to the parents too, but why would we do this? Why would we treat someone as different in an illness that is, one, anosognosic, but also an illness that hits people in adolescence, often late adolescence. And we're going to leave them unprotected because they're 18, and we're going to risk that they become chronic patients, and they're still our children. And I think that come, that's come up a lot, but we're all afraid of 18. We need to be, stop being afraid of 18, we need to change the laws around guardianship, around uh, the admissions to hospitals, about information to parents. We need a new paradigm, and for this, we need to ally with the larger mental health world. Because they're, they're fighting for it. But they think they need our help, and they, I think we also need to have an influence because of the kind of medical problems that we have in eating disorders. So I'd like to see that happen. I think one problem that parents experience that isn't as clear to the clinical world is how unauthoritative a parent will be in a clinical appointment, and how important it is, for example, Feast has just published wonderful booklets, and AED has published a wonderful booklet that we can take in our hand and bring <laughs> to providers, bring to an ER. And then we have some authority. Because if I just go in there, and I was just telling someone that, that this happens to me, 
okay, Laura Collins, big deal, right? If I go to my pediatrician and say, please don't tell my son that he needs to be at the 50th percentile for weight, he laughs. He continues to tell my son that he needs to lose weight. This is a boy who's been in the 90th percentile all his life. And I've had to fight this for years. I have zero authority to make this man stop doing this. I live in a small town. I do know what I'm doing, but I can't change doctors for, for reasons of you know, being in a small town and I need a certain, certain medical expertise. If I can't do that, you know what? I become pretty persuasive. If I can't do that, then I don't, can't expect that any parent would have the gumption to tell their doctor, look, this, the, the, this is what the science says. So we need stuff that we can bring to them to give us an authoritative stance. We need protocols that we can bring to professionals that are influencing our children, to lawmakers. We need that authority, and parents just don't have it. And even individual clinicians tell me they can't get other people on the team to come around because there's nothing authoritative. So we've got to do something about the lack of consensus and and actual statements that are being made so that we can all come together on this. You know, Goldilocks um, and the Three Bears and the, this one was too small, and this, one, this one's too hot, and this one's too cold, and this one's just right. With eating disorder treatment, you have to be the right sex, the right age, the right weight, the right diagnosis to get care in any particular context. <coughs> you can't just walk into an eating disorder treatment if you're a boy and get treatment in a lot of places because they only treat girls. Crazy. We have, if, we, if you don't lose enough weight, you can't be admitted. You can't get a diagnosis um, from a lot of people unless you exhibit um, enough symptoms. So we can't even catch people when they're early in their illness. Now there's a reason why we have these these diagnoses, but they're also holding us back because we've got a Goldilocks situation going on. And since most patients pass between those situations along the way, the circle is, is not working. As we discussed, we have a reset at every level of care. So patients are just at risk all the time, no matter, even if there's loving parents, great clinicians, and the history so far has been great, we're still at risk at every stage of treatment. And that doesn't need to be true. So the reality, and we're keeping on the circles here, is it's a revolving door. And here's something that's not a circle. What happens is when patients keep revolving in and out of care and going from place to place, there's resistance that grows, just like antibiotics. And I know too many families whose children have had lots of good care along the way, but because they've been in and out of treatment and their families have been made unable to keep them in care, keep them in good care, that they just get sicker and sicker. And I think it's preventable, and I think we're just not doing it. Part of the reason is on the professional side, and this is why I'm calling on the field, very specifically, to develop some consensus about anything. <laughs> I'm not joking. I love dearly and personally a lot of professionals in the field, and I respect the minds of many, many of the leaders in the field, but I can't get two of them to agree on really basic things. And if that's true, then we're in really big trouble. So I think we've got to hold people's feet to the fire and make them sit in the same room and make them come up with some consensus. And I think we need to start with organizations like the Academy for Eating Disorders and IADAP and our local advocacy organizations. And we all need to speak up on the fact that there needs to be some consensus. But that we can start with something small, like weight restoration, that would be good. Or, um, you know, we could pick any number of things that are very important, like the age limit, and pick it out of a hat and get to work on making sure that we close this circle. So, Parents, of course, we have a role in maintaining the circle in our homes. And we talk a lot about that, and I think that need to be this day, of course. But we as families do allow ourselves sometimes to get split and to blame other members of the family or to allow ourselves to get angry and blame. Again, I think referring back to the Edison it can be very helpful. 
Um, and I think we need to take our role as the center of the wheel very seriously and not allow ourselves to be put out on a spoke. And I think it's very difficult. And I know that sometimes when I'm in the doctor's office, I, you know, I just want to be, I want to be cooperative so that the doctor will, you know, do what I think is best or at least not be angry at me and take it out on my child. I, the temptation to be pleasing is, is great. So I think that if we all ally together, and especially in an advocacy way, we can do more of that. Communities have a role in maintaining the circle, and I don't think that we do enough in our communities because we are very secretive about the illness. Um, I, you know, a lot of you have known me as Laura Collins for many years, and I didn't use my real name, which is Laura Listerman, um, because I allowed myself to get cowed by my daughter's fear of being exposed and really holding her um, accountable. So it allowed her to keep her illness secret from her friends uh, for almost 10 years. And I now see that it was, it was not a bright idea on my part. I, I did the best I could at the time and nobody really told me that. But I look, look around you. We have an empowered community of parents. And I think that we can do something about the stigma now in a way that we couldn't before. And we can empower each other in normalizing this and not treating it as if we have to tiptoe around it. And also to know that it's natural for our kids to not want to talk about it and not want their friends to know. Kids don't want to be different. Mental illness is still heavily stigmatized, but we're going to have to start somewhere. And I'm not saying that everybody should just, like, you know, get a tattoo. <laughs> but I think we need to move forward and do as much of it as we can and we're comfortable with, and then more people will. Obviously, there's an enormous role for the professional community, but people are working really hard doing, taking care of their own patients, and we can't expect everyone to become an advocate. Um, I'm very impressed with some of the clinicians I know who do, um, who blog, Sarah, right? um, who get involved with social media. Um, I think we're, we're seeing uh, more of uh, where clinicians are being in contact with the public, getting involved with advocacy, and I think that's a good trend, and I think we should be working with them. Clinics and clinicians, obviously, it's really, really important, but I think we need to understand that a lot of times clinics are limited by many factors. For example, they their history. You know, someone takes over a clinic, they can't rock the boat completely among their staff, um, among with their mentors. So they have to reach people where they are. But there is a role for clinics and clinicians to maintain that circle, get parents in the middle of it, and to do a better job of staying up to date. Because again, I spent a lot of time in the professional community, and I am shocked at how not bragging. I don't read that extensively, but I know a heck of a lot more about the literature than a lot of my friends who are professionals. Partly, they're very busy, but they're treating a life-threatening mental illness of which the science is rapidly changing. And if they don't stay up to date, they really aren't serving their patients. They're well-meaning, but they're not serving their patients. And I shouldn't know more than they do about the current science. I'd like to see more mentoring. Um, among professionals, because there's a lot of good work to have going on out there. But the most important thing that I think that the professional, our professional allies could do is doing a better job of pressuring their own field to create protocols, to publish methods, to publish their, their, their results, and to get that consensus. Because we as a family can't Push, we, we can't get out there with information without that authority. And we just don't have, because we don't have the letters behind our name to be able to say to people, listen, I'm not crazy. You really need to do white restoration, or my daughter really does need to monitoring during lunch. It, it, I need to be able to go down to the school and say, this is an appropriate thing to do, and I'm not enmeshed. <laughs> so we need, we need something we can either hold or that we can refer people to that says that this is an appropriate parental behavior. <laughs> yeah. 
I think the advocacy world also needs to give some thought to how it's treating um, fellow advocates. We have outright war between some advocacy organizations and others. There is a Pac-Man game going on of uh, groups that try to eat up other groups, or they don't want to collaborate with other groups. Uh, situations where somebody might, offer, for example, offer free uh, a free table at a conference, and the other organization won't do it. We have people who've uh, started their own organizations instead of getting involved with organizations that still exist. Guilty, I did it myself because I felt that there needed to be a parent organization. But the whole goal of when we started Feast was that eventually we would be obsolete because all of the other organizations would have the same focus and interest in parents as we do. Hasn't happened yet. But I hope it will. And I hope that there will be fewer advocacy <coughs> organizations with more allegiances to one another. And it requires some uncomfortable stuff. I don't agree with all the other advocates out there. But I am committed to sitting down and eating with and knocking back a beer with and engaging in conversations with people with whom I disagree. Because I think that's the only way we're going to move forward. Being right in a corner alone doesn't work for me. And I think there's too much of that going on among advocates. And I'm calling on my fellow advocates to, we need to do a better job of talking to each other and talking to people that we don't agree with. Obviously, our legal systems need help. And they're not going to do it if we don't call for it. Dr. Tom Sinsel, the head of the NIMH, everybody knows how I feel about his work. I think he's wonderful. But one of the things that he told me was that until parents stand up and make, make call for change, that the government can't do anything. It's got to come from parents. And he cited ADHD as an example, where nothing was going on until the parent community got involved. Childhood leukemia, also. You name it, schizophrenia. There are so many illnesses, it's taken the parents to stand up and do something. Uh, Matt, that's mothers. I think we don't know the power we have and we, that we need to do it, but we need to come together and not just go off and do our own thing, but try to join what's going on. For example, Feast is doing amazing work and needs volunteers and needs people to get involved and not just to do their own things, but to get involved with what's already going on because a lot of us have spent a lot of time building something that needs to be carried on. And people need to move on. And new people need to come up with new ideas and new energy. And I'm, I'm so excited when I see the new families come in and see them get involved. It's a, it's a great way to give back. So here's my radical proposal. I'd like to see, and I'm calling it right now for lack of a better word, but 360 protocol. Going back to the circles. I think we need to start by, just this is really simple, we need to identify the problem. We need to identify the patient, the diagnosis, the resources available to, to, to treat the person, and what our goal is in treatment. Believe it or not, that doesn't really happen. We're in emergency management all the time. We're just, okay, well, let's get them through this stage. And we just sit around going, oh my God, it's kind of works, yeah. I think we need to have, take a moment to say, we need to actually identify what we're doing with whom, with what resources. And then we need to create the circle. And we need to not sit back until the circle is complete. And I think what we do is we just kind of like draw part of it, and then we think, well, I can't do, I can't complete it, so I'm just gonna do my best. And so you have a, a mother working her tail off to feed her child, even though the rest of the circle is not participating. And so moms get burnt out, she, her husband's angry, her kids are frustrated, she's losing her job. I talked to so many mothers who are you know, just weeping because they're working so hard. But the problem isn't how hard they're working, it's that the rest of the circle's not there. So to have somebody working hard, a clinician, a parent, you know, without having the full circle there, we need to step back and make sure the circle's there before we go any further because we're burning people out, and we're not doing a good job. We're just patients bouncing off. 
So we have to make that circle, identify it, figure out who's the lead. I know it sounds weird, but I've experienced this, and I've, I've talked to so many families who end up with this situation where they've got, yeah, we've got a great psychiatrist, but this super nutritionist, the therapist is awesome, but they're not coordinated, nobody's in charge, and so anything can slip it out of place, because all you need is um, a, a, an emergency, something bad happens, and then all of a sudden the doctor is involved, and the whole thing goes out of, out of whack. So making sure that you've got a lead, that there's a full circle, so that people aren't spinning their wheels. Establishing communication, because again, clinicians are not paid to talk to each other. And if we don't have that in place, it doesn't work. And we all, I think most of us have experienced this, where we're the one doing the, the discussing, but we're not trusted. So the circle's not complete. So let's not do it unless we're gonna get the full circle. That's just, I think we can actually say, hey, we don't have a full circle. And we, we just can't move forward until we do that, instead of this cycle that we go through. So we gotta fill in the gaps. If there is a gap, fill it in before you do all this work. And then we need to document it and share it. And that's, I'm gonna to come to that in just a second on, on how that can work. But we have to hold the circle, and that's another thing. Sometimes you get a plan, and then it falls out of place, you don't know what's it, and then the circle's not there anymore. You gotta keep making sure that it's held all the way around, make sure the communication's going between disciplines, between caregivers, and through the stages of recovery, because we all know it falls down there. <coughs> and then we need to have a plan for making sure that we're retracing it over and over again to make it stronger and to keep it going so that circles don't wear through, through the, the, the whole trajectory. And we need to continue into and beyond normal because I think we all know that what happens a lot of times is everybody runs out of steam. And you don't have any more money for treatment, and the kid seems fine, and that is where the circle breaks. And you set yourself up for, for relapse or other problems. So the circle has to stay strong. It has to keep being retraced. And then, and this maybe shouldn't be part of it, but I believe it should be part of it, is that now that you've drawn it, I think we need to share it because each of us is only a data point of one, but it's an important and hard one data point, and I think that each one of our families should count in having done it. The good things that happen, the bad things that happen, if we can share our stories in some way, either by becoming a mentor, or writing a book, getting involved with other families, uh, being, being involved in any way with the eating disorder advocacy world, be there, because if you don't show up, your absence is definitely felt. There are a lot of people out there who don't believe that parents care. They don't believe that parents are going to step up. We need to prove that that's not true, and, it, and each of us needs to be part of that. It doesn't have to be a lot. It could just do one small thing. Just make sure that one other family down, you know, down in the soccer field knows that your, your family went through this and what happened. That's helpful because all of the silence is definitely causing a problem. And all of us know that the eating disorders are more common than would seem if you just look out into society. A lot of us are experiencing things that we're not telling anyone. So I think if each of us can do one meaningful thing, it could really make a difference. So I'd like to envision that the 360 protocol works. I know it's a big dream, but I think we gotta kind of start with a dream instead of just running around in a disorganized fashion. And I do envision that this could be true, that we could have a way of looking at treatment instead of modalities as us, these circles that we create. We could make sure that patients are identified early if our laws, our communities, our families, our clinicians, and our families were all pulling those circles together. We could make sure that people are surrounded by support at the time they need it, which isn't always always true. We can have a common view of eating disorders, and I think that is something we need very, very badly. The systems could support one another rather than bounce up against <coughs> each other and cause, you know, friction. You know, when you're trying to get your your psychiatrist to come along with your you and you're trying to keep your husband in the circle and everything, then everybody's efforts are not working as well. 
if we could get the circle going, then everybody's work is going to be more effective. And of course, the ultimate goal is that the patients get well and they stay well. That's what we all want. So again, identify it, draw it, hold it, retrace it, and then share it. That's my vision for what we could be doing as a community. And if the circle holds, here's another scenario. I have a 17-year-old boy, they go to the therapist, they diagnose bulimia. And the parents do things that help the situation and are all created, are everything here, learning about their insurance plan, taking it seriously, inventorying public resources, and then reassuring their son and the siblings that it's going to be OK and they're going to get through it as a family. That's what I envision the circle being able to do for the family. I think if we could have the circle work a little better, we could have schools that are helping us take care of our children with mental illness and not pulling away from us. And there's some specific things, and I'm, I'm going to point out, you can, uh, um, anyone who wants this PowerPoint, if they want to see these, that I'm glad to give it to them. But not doing BMI report cards in school would be a real help to our families. You know, I mean, it's, it seems very simple. Don't teach calorie counting in school. You know, this, this is not helpful. Um, offering space at school for supported meals. These are really simple things, but if we had protocols, we shared them, we had educated families, and we had authoritative things to say, we could make this happen in our schools. We could educate pediatricians so that they will hold the circle with us. This is a real gap for a lot of us because we trust our pediatricians, and they don't necessarily know about eating disorders. They may know about other things, but not eating disorders. And we can help them be part of the strong circle instead of pulling away from the rest of what your therapist is so hard trying to do and what you as a family are trying to do. The karate instructor. I mean, just people in the community who have an influence on our children could benefit from us having all of these things in place as well. They could be part of the team. And imagine how, how helpful it would be if all of our coaches and all of these people who are influencing our children had an attitude about exercise and food. They didn't schedule things during meals. They encouraged a balanced approach to movement and not extreme ideas about food. They didn't constantly talk about how you should skip meals. This would be really helpful to the circle. Laws, obviously, need to be changed, including recognizing <coughs> anosognosia as a factor in treatment. We're gonna, this is going to be a leap, because not everyone believes in it, but I think we can, we can get there. And there's quite a few things, obviously, that legally could help us as families to get this done, support providers, support us. Advocates could be publishing information that is helpful to all families and is based on science instead of the popular, fun ideas about loving your body. I'm sorry, I don't, I don't think that advocacy work that focuses on loving your body is the right message. And as a matter of fact, I think it, it can be negative for, our, for us. And the, the thing is that advocacy organizations need to come together and agree about whether we're going to do this or not. Insurance, a lot of improvement could go on there. And again, this is an American problem, but it would have an impact on other countries as well. If insurance paid for consultation time, <coughs> if it paid for all spectrums of care, um, if it spread out the time, that it approved treatment, and if it went well, or treatment according to protocols, it would be very helpful. This is going to be hard to do, but it's not going to happen unless we fight for it as families. Siblings, obviously, a very, very important part of supporting a patient, and also they suffer terribly from the crisis in the family, and we could be having them join in the circle instead of being bounced themselves out and alienated from the family. I think it's a hidden resource that, that FPT modestly does much better than anything else, but I think we could all be adopting more attention to and honoring the siblings. So I'm going to leave you with this. I'm going to eat a picture that today, I can't do the calculation in my head, 
But all around the world, today as we're sitting here, there are families who are going to wake, who woke up this morning thinking they had a normal life, and by the time they go to bed tonight, they're going to realize that their child is seriously mentally ill with an eating disorder. They are waking up tomorrow in a world where feast exists, where there is some progress, where there is a parent community. But I think if each of us can think about the families next month and next year that are going to come to this, what progress are we going to make between now and the end of the year, now and five years from now? Can we make a difference in what's going to happen to that family who wakes up one day and has to make a radical change in what they think is going on in their life? And we were that family. Each of us who had this situation were that family at some time. And there were advocates out there who had done something, even if it was one thing, even if it was just sitting next to someone at the soccer field and saying, you know, I, I had this problem, and handed them a pamphlet. I'm not asking everyone to do like really big things and give up their life and, and become full-time advocates, but if everybody was doing some small thing so that that family who woke up today has some comfort and doesn't feel as alone and gets better information, I think that really, really is significant. Please don't underestimate how much it matters what each of you is doing. And just by coming here and being supportive of one another, it's an enormous help. And I, every year after we have this conference, I talk to parents who just felt an extra surge of energy and, and empowerment because they've been around other parents who've got it. And I think that's what we're doing for each other here. It's really exciting.